when you look at your children and they are doing reasonably well out there, if you watch them, if you were to send them to your best friend's house, you know, would they be assholes? When you send them over to the neighbors or to school, are they absolute dicks to the hockey coach? Okay, then we then we might have a problem. Okay, but if most of the time, if you look at your kids and they're great with everybody else, you're fucking crushing them. Hello, welcome to another episode of Bunny Hugs and Mental Health. I am your host, Todd Rennebaum. Welcome to another week. It's going to be a great episode. I am talking with Dr. Jody Carrington, the Dr. Jody Carrington. She is a, a speaker. She talks all over the world. Uh, she's a best-selling author, and she's a child psychologist and just a real stand-up chick. <laughs> she's uh, she's very smart. We had a really great conversation. Uh, we talked about uh, just contentment and making connections and parenting and boundaries and all types of stuff. The the conversation just went bloop and away we went. Uh, we had no real no real agenda. We just we just started talking. So that's coming up uh, next week. Mm, boy oh boy, next week is a very special episode. It's actually two episodes coming out. Uh, it is the 100th episode of Bunny Hugs and Mental Health. Uh, one episode I'm speaking with Haley Rose. She is a fan favorite and a, a host favorite. Uh, she's been on the oh, she's a couple episodes now, so this will be her third appearance on the on the podcast. And it was her, with her too, we just we just start talking. Uh, and I also speak with Trash. That's another episode, and Trash has been on uh, for a couple episodes as well. We've uh, in the past we've talked about Trash's histrionic personality disorder and their DID or Dissociative Identity Disorder. Uh, and in this coming up episode, we talk about their diagnosis with Schizotype Al, uh, along with other stuff. And again, Trash is another fan favorite. I, I, I really wanted both of them on the same episode and all three of us have a chat, but it's kind of hard sometimes to line up schedules. So uh, I just decided to do two 100 episodes. So there, plus a little while back, a former guest asked to have their episode taken down. So technically, there is two 100 episodes, so there you go. Uh, and yeah, I've already got way more recorded for, for the weeks to follow that. Ugh, so many guests, so many wonderful guests. Ugh. Anyhow, please rate and review the podcast. I know I say it every week, but every week, you're not doing it, so do it. Uh, go on Apple Podcasts, rate and review. Um, I shouldn't say you're not doing it. You know, some people are. Follow me on Instagram, Bunny Hugs Podcast. On TikTok, Bunny Hugs Podcast. On Facebook, Bunny Hugs and Mental Health. Okay, that's out of the way. So anyway, back to this episode. Uh, without further ado, I give you best-selling author, Dr. Jody Carrington. My name is Dr. Jody Carrington. I'm a psychologist, uh, a clinical psychologist. I spent most of my years training in uh, Saskatchewan. So Saskatchewan has a massive piece of my heart. I was in Regina. I did my master's, my PhD at the University of Regina. Go Cougars. And um, I, I don't know. I grew up in a small town in Alberta and I really very, listen, privileged. I started on third base, white, straight, able-bodied, uh, all of the things that... Um, can lead to uh, a leg up before you even know you have it. That's the definition of privilege. And um, it was a teacher, you know, in this small town, K to 12, that um, really inspired me, not because she, I remember anything that she taught me, but I remember how she made me feel. And I remember thinking, that's what I want to do for the rest of my life. I want to spend time, you know, making people feel that way. And so I ended up doing um, two years as a civilian member with the Royal Canadian Mount of Police and started to learn about organizations and trauma and the world of first responders and um, did my master's, and my PhD all around stress and um, trauma. And then I did my residency in Nova Scotia and they said, you have to do rotation with kids. And I was like, listen, I'm not a fan of children. And uh, despite the fact that I have three of my own now, I'm kind of coming around, but I, um, but I fell in love with the tiny humans and it was a great piece in my career where I started to understand about trauma and the processes of trauma from a neurological perspective, you know, from birth up. 
and really what that means to sort of understand. And so, yeah, so then I started to understand a little bit about that. And I came back to Alberta and I took my first job at the Alberta Children's Hospital and I stayed on a lap psychiatric inpatient unit for kids for 10 years. And um, I, uh, I learned that we do everything wrong. I feel like <laughs> we are playing by a set of rules that were established for a world that no longer exists. And most of it revolves around behaviorally modifying people to stay emotionally regulated. And when you struggle significantly with mental health, one of the biggest things you, you struggle with the most is emotional regulation, staying calm in times of distress. You need people uh, to walk you through hard things. And the more um, stigma that we have around mental health, the farther people run when you are struggling um, with anything that they can't see. And so I started to write a book about it. I started to um, speak uh, lots of times about it. And uh, after I left the children's hospital, we had three kids in very short period of time. We had um, a beautiful ki- uh, son and then I got twins. Jesus gave me twins at 38 years old. It's such a great blessing. <laughs> I'm so grateful. So good. They're 10 now, um, but everything's good. And, um, and so I started a little private practice here in this town where we moved because my husband, who's a farmer said, I think, um, I think we need to move closer to my mother. So you'll be better. I was like, Oh, fantastic. So I woke up here drugged, but which is fine. And I really love this little town. So then I just started to speaking, speaking to schools. And and generally, this is the question, Todd, that I ask all the time. We get messed up so much in trying to sort of fix people that we ask what is wrong with you all the time. And when we switch that question to what has happened to you, tell me your story. What do I need to know about you and the way your brain functions and the way that you show up in the world and, you know, who's been in and out of your life? Then suddenly um, the empathy to sort of understand our necessity on this planet to walk each other home um, becomes so much more clear. So the private practice, I was coaching hockey and then I uh, wrote a book called Kids These Days and it became a national bestseller. And um, then we wrote Teachers These Days. It became a national bestseller too. And I started speaking around the globe and then Harper Collins came to me and said, We'd like to publish a book if you'd write us one. And uh, I was like, let me check my skin. Yes. So that launched in uh, January and we are like 25,000 copies in. So it's going great. Nice. Yeah. And that's the the one about self-sabotage? Well, Feeling Seen is really about relationships and reconnecting in a disconnected world. It's really about, um, you know, guiding us to understand a little bit about like, why are we so fucked up and why in you know, these industrial countries, why we have everything, the the more money and the more research and resources you have, the higher the rates that we kill ourselves. And it is fucking ridiculous to me that we've never had so much access to resources and we've never been this ill. We are dying faster from emotional illness than from physical illness for the first time in history. And we're really confused about why, uh, because we should be. And the answer, I'll just give you the the reason why in a one statement is because we've never been this disconnected. We are neurobiologically wired for connection. And the hardest thing we will do is look into the eyes of the people we love. And in just two generations, we've never been given so many exit ramps to look away. And we're paying Mm. the price. And on the heels of COVID, um, so for three years, for the physical safety of our communities, we had to physically separate. And uh, there will be, for the remainder of our lifetimes, yours and mine, uh, a mental health crisis that will be significantly uh, impacted by that experience as a globe. Well, I my son is 18. Mm-hmm. His whole high school career mm-hmm. was in my basement mm-hmm. and o- online. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, mm-hmm. he, he, he graduated and he just finished his first year of university. Mm-hmm. But again, it was online because... He was so nervous. He had like so full of anxiety to actually one oh. leave our house mm-hmm. and two like yeah be social and like mm-hmm. um, he's come around though. He mm-hmm. it took him this year to like you know get kind of back to where he was pre COVID and uh, and just some practice and some skills and and yeah to believe you can do it and to stay emotionally regulated when shit goes south because it's supposed to be trying your first year of university. You're right. The question right, is, right. then what do we do with it? Where do we put it? Do we just avoid it? And if we have the opportunities to just avoid it, the longer we do that, then we perpetuate anxiety. And so it is exposure um, coupled with the ability to stay regulated, people to help you stay regulated. And we have a set of university and college professors that don't understand 
because they too have survived a pandemic and they're exhausted and burnt out. And, you know, so we have this really interesting time of helpers and those who need the walking. Everybody's done. Mm -hmm. Um, The question will never be, you know, how do we get past, you know, getting people healthy? How do we make everybody emotionally regulated? We won't arrive there because the human condition is such that we will always get upset that, it, you know, we have this range of emotions. What we require is enough infrastructure to be able to have people to do well enough to do the walking, you know, healthy parents, healthy educators, healthy first responders, um, because all of us will play those roles and then need them at the same time. Do you think capitalism has a, a role? Mm, Jesus. Why don't we just jump right in? What do you you tell me? What you think? Do you think capitalism has a role? I, uh, yeah, I'm sure that. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, a role. I don't know if it's the main contributor to our our mental health issues in the West or whatever. But um, but it's strange. It's like the you, you always hear about the poorest countries in the world, and they're like the happiest countries in the world too. It's like do you want to know why? Because they spend more time together. <clears throat> right. Right. Yeah. And they have to. So if we look at, at you know, the data is interesting around this, the centurions, so the, the people who live the longest are around the healthiest on this planet. The research is really interesting. The village effect is written by Susan Pinker. She's a Canadian psychologist as well. And she said, if you, she did some research around, um, it's a, there's an island off of Corsica. So just off of Italy where people are healthiest and what she predicted or what she found, not predicted, what she found was that it isn't actually Um, you know, how many best friends you have, if you drink, if you smoke, if you eat well, the biggest predictor of health, overall health, mental and physical health is social interaction. And just your ability to sort of like, and they live close together, they still are required to go every day to the post office or to, you know, get their fresh bread or do the things. I mean, they live in the shabby little like, you know, things, I mean, they're on the ocean is beautiful. But you know, you, you open your shutters, and there's, you know, Elna, Okay, so you have to engage and you have to do the things, right? And you you don't even have to be friends with people. You just more so have to have enough knowledge that there's people in your community walking with you when, not if, shit goes south. And that knowledge of social reciprocity, of knowing that people are there, is so good for the system. And it is the thing that we shy away from the most because we're like, oh, judgment, social media. Um, am I good enough? I'm too fat. I'm too skinny. I'm too old. I'm too, I'm fucking up as a parent. Cause when I look at everybody else, oh my God, they're doing family pictures and shit, drinking collagen. I don't even fuck it. Okay. I'm not even going to do nothing. Eh? I want to work from home. Okay, great. But the ramifications of that is massive. I was just, I would just did another interview with, with, with someone and I was talking about how much I hate small talk. But I, you know, I do love community and I love connection, but I don't, it's like, I'm very picky and choosy with who I want to spend my time with and who I want to connect with. And, um, I don't know, but I wonder if those, I wonder if some of those places, it's like, they're all very like-minded people too. Whereas here it's all, you know, there's a lot of extremes and there's, um, you know, politics is like, it, it, you know what I mean? there they don't worry about that stuff they're just well but and here's what's interesting for the, I, I think you know social media is not social because you choose who to follow yeah. right so i am <laughs> shocked when you know somebody who doesn't believe what i believe gets appointed into government or you know that that they would actually sort of you know put this bill through when i'm like are you kidding me like my entire world does not believe in that thing and i think this is the point right is that we then get very structured and tunnely And people are hard to hate close up. Brene Brown says this, and I just adore it, because if you only surround yourself with people who look like you, sound like you, smell like you, believe like you, it becomes very difficult to sharpen that skill of empathy, to learn what it must be like to understand or to live in the in this world, um, in the body of a transgendered woman, to understand what it's like to survive cancer, to understand what it means to right anything that doesn't look like you, 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 you know, it is so necessary to have experiences and social engagement is where we get those corrective experiences, where we get those even, uh, you know, experiences that sort of give us that like, okay, yep, that's what I really believe. So who you surround yourself with becomes so critically important, not 
in this cancel way of, I don't want anything that I don't agree with in my world, but being very careful about who promotes your growth, your thinking, your open-mindedness. How, what do you feel like when you have certain conversations with people? How do you make sure that you're engaging in a place that fills your soul first so that you're emotionally regulated and then you learn and then you teach? And it's sort of that cycle that we get to do again and again and again every day. And what's so critical is we weren't meant to do any of this alone. And so if we have a solid network of people, whether it's a support group or it's our family system or they're, you know, sort of people who become family to us, our best friend's mom, um, that's often the first step of creating that village that matters so much if we want to sort of take that next step to change or to grow or to whatever that looks like. Huh? It's almost like those two, that two part process that becomes necessary. And I, I love that conversation we had taught around, you know, just even in your own mental health journey, if you think about the times where you could heal the best or grow the best or develop the most insights around, you know, the way your brain or anybody else's brain functions, it's like you have people that can sort of support you through that, not judge you through that but walk you through that a little bit, right? And I think that's that's the most critical aspect of healing, particularly in the world of trauma, is that, you know, we we weren't meant to sort of, it, like emotions won't kill you. Anxiety, depression, they won't kill you because they're just emotions. They don't have that capacity, but not talking about them might. Right. And uh, the, the, uh, so I, I kind of quoted AA earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if that'll make the episode or not, but... Um, I found that with peer support groups, it's, there is a lot of that, that it's like, because it, well, in 12 step groups, especially. So there's, I don't know. Are you very familiar with 12 step groups? Mm-hmm. Okay. So, you know, there's no outside bullshit. Um, you don't talk about politics or sports or anything. It's, you know, there's kind of guidelines to, to run the meeting and it's, in a small town, there's people that I would assume like, oh, I'm not going to get along with them. They don't vote the way I vote. They cheer for another team or whatever. But you get together and it's like, oh, we did, we do have so much more in common, including traumas and stuff. And we make these connections. And it's, it is like I, I've always left meetings just feeling, yeah, better about myself and better about my community. Well, you know what's interesting to me is that we all start in the exact same place. So if you think about this conceptually, every single person on this planet right now, the first thing all of us felt first was the heartbeats of our mamas. That rhythmic exchange, that emotional regulation that is the sort of basis of any of us when we need to be calmed down or walk through something, we don't need words. We need, mm hmm, mm hmm, okay, okay. Okay, that rhythmic exchange. If I put a crying infant in anybody's arms across this globe in this moment, there would be the same interaction. A soldier in Russia, somebody in Southeast Asia, somebody in Coquitlam, BC, a nurse in uh, Afghanistan. If I put a, a police officer in... Antarctica. Right. And if I put a crying infant in anybody's arms and they can't give that baby away, instantly a rhythmic exchange occurs in an effort to walk that baby home. That is regardless of age, race, religion, socioeconomic status, or gender identity, because race is a social construct. Our DNA as humans is 99.998% the same. And we are way more alike than we are different. And despite the fact that we can all love things or have experiences that have made us, um, you know, appreciate a team or a political value different or whatever, All that it comes down to is that when we are acknowledged, we rise. And we have the ability every single day as humans, regardless of how I judge you or see you or believe or condone or support what you show up in this world as, what we need more from each other is simply that ability to just feel seen. And some of the most, I think, remarkable stories, one of my favorite people on the planet is a guy named Jesse Thistle. He wrote From the Ashes. Uh, He's an indigenous man that was born in Saskatchewan and um, he was in care. Um, The thought is his dad was killed. He still can't find him. Separated from mom, raised by grandmother, um, in and out of care, was homeless, was in jail. Um, He's now finishing his PhD at York University, married to a lovely woman and they have a baby. And part of the question to Jesse in From the Ashes, he tells his, his story, you know, is really about what were the moments that allowed you to rise given all of this trauma. And he's, he tells these beautiful stories, you know, things like, you know, this, this shop owner, um, you know, knowing he's going to steal from her, you know, gives him a meal. 
um, this other beautiful story. He's in Brampton, Ontario. I think I'm going to get the story right, but he's sitting on a corner homeless with a, a cup and somebody kneels down and asks him his, his name. Hmm. And when he said, I, I hadn't heard myself say my name for months and just the ability of this human to be able to say, what's your name? And he said, it's Jesse, you know, and this, this guy responded and, and gave him his name and said, you know, here's, I have five bucks. I hope you get a coffee today, sir. It's so nice to see your smile gave him the belief that there is somebody in there with that name that deserves so much more than this. And I think we really underestimate our power as humans to be able to give that away. Not necessarily, we're all constantly in the state of wanting to receive it, but my goodness, the biggest superpower we have is to be able to give it away. Hmm. Interesting. Huh. But yeah, so it's a fine line too of, is it though? <laughs> you know, do I take care of myself first and then help others, or is it a, or is it kind of a, a constant flow of both? Oh my gosh, that's such a good question. I was just writing about this this morning because you can't give away something you've never received, which right. is you know so true when we think about multiple generations of abuse, neglect, and trauma, or those who've survived a cultural genocide. There is something interesting, however, about that balance between knowing that you are most emotionally regulated when you're laughing when you're eating, when you're being kind to somebody else. And so sometimes our ability to fill up happens in being conscious about giving somebody a compliment or paying for somebody's coffee in Tim Hortons, right? Just that small shift of, I can contribute to this world. And there's a fill up in that, that I think we super underestimate in our ability to then be well ourselves, right? Because I don't think it's either our, I don't think you are focused on self-care and say, fuck it, everybody else, or I'm just going to give everybody else my whole heart and be like, fuck it, I'm going to forget about myself. You can't, you can never do this. We are always in the state of being a walker and a walkie because I, I respond or I, I respond. I often think about this quote by Ram Dass. Um, he's a dead guy and he's a philosopher and a yogi. And, and he said, we're all just here walking each other home. Hmm. And I love it. When I first heard it, it was the most profound statement I've ever heard in the English language. And I think about that every single day. My ability to be a walker for my children, for my husband, for my team, um, for my community is predicated on how much I look after myself. Right? And that's hard, particularly as a woman, to be like, no, no, I need to take my vitamins or I need to you know, do whatever go for a run, drink my water, all that bullshit. Um, but if I don't do that, at least a little bit of the time, I'm going to have a really hard time serving other people. And when I'm in a state of serving other people, if I'm in a state of resentment, it's a waste of time. Yeah. yeah. It's costing me money. Yeah. It's, I mean, yeah. not money. It's costing me energy. You know, it's costing me myself. If I'm serving in a place of, if I'm being kind or walking other people home in a place where I'm regulated, that's where it fills me up. Mm -hmm. That makes sense? It's such a fine yeah, line. Absolutely, right. yeah. Yeah, and, and like you said, like when you are, I mean, this isn't always the case, but when you are giving something, you're actually receiving something back by giving. So it is kind of a two-way two -way street sometimes. I mean, not always. Sometimes you are, you spread yourself then trying to constantly give to other people. And then, then that's, you know, the balance is, is not, you're out of balance then, but. And we know um, that, right? We know mm -hmm. that if, if giving away doesn't feel good, that's the biggest indicator. If I am, you know, serving, I'm volunteering in six different places. I am resentful because I have to show up to my kids. That was my biggest indicator. And I talk about this in feeling seen of, when boundaries are such a question these days, right? What the hell does that mean? The most compassionate people on the planet are the most boundaried, which means I know how much I can give, which means I know when I need to be able to say no, because for example, if, I, if I'm gonna see you in therapy and you're gonna be like, hey, listen, the only time I can come is Sunday night and I'm an absolute disaster, um, for years, I'd be like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like my job is to be able to serve in this capacity, right? Now, as a mom of three kids, Sunday nights are sacred, right? And so when I'm presented with that issue, you need to see me tonight in this private practice. I need to be able to say, gosh, I'm, I'm worried about you. If you're not safe, here's the three things I want you to think about. 
but my availability this week is Monday morning and Wednesday at four. And I would really love to see you. I hope you can make either of those work. I just can't on Sunday night. I'm so sorry. And then you might say, okay, fine. Monday morning at eight, I'll make it work. So how do I show up Monday morning at eight versus if I said, fine, I'll come in Sunday night, right? When there's a resentment factor, I'm not going to show up with my whole heart anyways. Right. But when we set that limit to be able to say, hey, you got me all day long. I would really love to be this for you. Here's, here's where I can do it. Then, man, it's so much easier to stay in that place of, okay, I did it. And people often think, you know, boundaries is this like thing of like, you stay off my lawn. I do not allow this, 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 this. This is inappropriate, not acceptable. You know, like, well, fuck off. You don't, you don't set a boundary when you're emotionally dysregulated. You think mm-hmm. about those things when you're regulated. And then your job is to uphold them in times of being pulled to be the soccer dad coach, being pulled to be, you know, whatever it is. We're going to this family dinner that I know my heart just can't handle or whatever the the, the deal is, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Um, it's true. Boundaries, uh, boundaries are tough, aren't they? They're hard to put in place and then to keep because then you get, you know, you feel guilty, you feel like a bad son or a bad husband or a bad employee and, and but but you're right that that does give that to a street of giving and taking in a way but yeah. you're 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 taking by setting a boundary but you're giving because you are uh in a good place to be able to give so then you take again that good feeling and it's yeah, it's <laughs> this, this perfect balance, isn't it? Oh my gosh, um, balance is bullshit at the end of the day because we really never arrive. But it is, <laughs> it is, it is really, I think, that issue, which I think is so great, Todd, about, you know, when you are at your best self, again, you know, joy is the most vulnerable emotion on the planet. And one of the measures for me of wellness is when people have the ability to to laugh at themselves and to laugh at the people around them and to sink into some joy because people who are really ill or people who are really hard on themselves don't think they deserve joy. Mm-hmm. And I love being able to sort of explore that question about why not, right? Who told you that? Where did you come to that conclusion, right? How, how did you decide? And maybe it's true, but we just got to look at a little bit about, you know, what, how did we get there? And what is the cost if we belly laugh with our babies, you know, two hours past bedtime? Well, how do we sink into dancing in our kitchen and, you know, doing the things where we, you know, laugh through staff meetings? I mean, all, all of those things, I think, are indicators um, in terms of, you know, what we need to do a, a little bit sometimes, even on our day to day issues of, of staying back in this place of being well. You know, because it's it's not an end game. You don't sort of like, good, I'm good. I've survived it now. I've went to my, you know, I, I went to the treatment programs. I did this. I'm following these rules. I'm eating well. Fuck, it's a roller coaster, right? And it's okay, the permission to be like, today is a hard day, or I'm going to fuck it up again, or I'm going to do all of the, you know, I think it it is really just that ability to know that you have somewhere to land when the hard stuff comes, not if. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, part of doing that is making sure, for me anyway, was to make sure I had a really good support system around me. Um, And this kind of is part of everything we're talking about. Um, Once I got sober and once I started getting somewhat healthier, making my my circle a lot smaller, Mm. uh, making it more quality than quantity. Yeah. Um, making, you know, creating that balance more where it's like this person is not taking so much of me and my time and my energy. And it's hard. It's a, it's a, it's work being friends with someone. It shouldn't feel like that. Right. And then other people, it's just, yeah, it's just this beautiful, I have this beautiful little bubble now. And that's amazing. Do you think, yeah. how hard is it to rebuild after you've burned almost every bridge? <laughs> I mean, because I think that's the question for so many people that I get, you know, as a psychologist, what if I don't have those people? You know, where do I start? What it, what if I fucked it up and I, you know, wrecked my marriage and my kids don't talk to me? And, you know, I mean, if we think about all the times that, you know, we've had conversations with people about that, I love those questions. Like, what what, what would you say to that? How did you do that? Kijiji. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I don't know. Um, <laughs> um, you know, so I didn't quite ruin everything. So I did still have some, 
I still always had a pretty good support group, uh, or yeah. not support group, but support sports. For me, I don't. For me, it was more like I just ed- I did some editing. Uh, I didn't have to start all over again. So I know some people that you know they start all over and they meet fr- people in like support groups and things like that. Yeah. And it takes a while. It takes a while to to rebuild uh, uh, the you know a nice bubble of people that you love and support and you can trust. Uh, and you, you trust them, they trust you. Uh, so it, it is, it's good. It takes some trial and error. You start all, all over again, but at least now you have the awareness. You, you can be, you can see red flags. Whereas before it was just, Hey, this is a cool drinking buddy. And, uh, you know, it doesn't matter what he does at home, beats his wife or whatever. It's like, I like drinking with him. <laughs> you know? So yeah. now you have that awareness where it's like, oh no, this, this person is sucking energy from me. And it's not good for me. And I yeah. think, I think that's the point. And I would, you know, I would just argue that, you know, wherever we are in our, in our days, one of the benefits of, you know, where we're at in this lifetime, you know, social media, the technological advances, really there is the place that allows us to connect or reconnect with people that, um, we can feel some solidarity with or that we can feel seen by. And I think that that's such a point, right? Is that like sort of when you are acknowledged and not, you know, somebody trying to judge you or use you or fix you, but -hmm. really just truly holding space for what it's like to be you um, is, is so necessary. Right. And, and oftentimes it is people that have experienced things like you have, and none of our stories are exactly the same. I mean, that's, Mm -hmm. that's the issue, right? You can't sort of be like, yes, me too. That's projection. Um, but this idea of having empathy for somebody is one of our biggest superpowers because you actually don't have to have been an alcoholic or had schizophrenia or, um, you know, lot, buried a child to be able to be empathic with another human being. It really is about suspending judgment and stepping into somebody else's. It doesn't mean you condone it or support it or you even believe what they believe. But empathy is spending judgment and stepping into another human being. And I think it's the single most important skill because you're not born with it you have to experience it to give it away or develop it um Mm. but i think it's the single most important skill we can give our children and i think it's the single most important skill we can sort of hone because um we're we're all pretty shitty at it to be honest and um the more you use it the more you sort of wonder about particularly people who are not like you what it must be like to experience those things um Mm -hmm. and feel the feelings with them yeah yeah, that was a big thing for me when I got sober and going through treatment. Not that I want to make this all about my no, treatment I love it. or whatever. I love it. Yeah, um, was learning to be humble and to be because in in my treatment, I don't know if every treatment's like this, but for me, there was no one on one counseling. It was always group. Okay. So you're hearing everybody's stories, and there are people that I would never in a million years sit down and have conversations with normally. I'm stuck with them. And so you're hearing backstories from all types of ages and, um, you know, different races and creeds and everything. And it's like, you know, you, you, I did learn empathy for, for a lot of people. And, and it, it, it's something you still have to, you have to practice it and maintain that empathy. Otherwise you can quickly become bitter again or whatever. Um, but it was a good month boot camp. (laughs) <laughs> to not just look at myself hard, yeah. but to look at my my judgments hard and and have empathy for others. Oh, that is so, what a beautiful experience in so many ways. I mean, I can imagine fucking brutal in, in so many others. But I think like that's just the experience that, you know, isolation doesn't allow us. And the more full of shame you become when you are marred with addiction or the disconnection that happens with mental health issues, um, it, disconnection is usually our answer, right? We disconnect Mm -hmm. from ourselves. We numb from emotion. We stay away from the people who, you know, we don't want to disappoint and that they're often the people we love the most. Right. Yeah. yeah, And and so it's interesting in, in situations or experiences like that, where, you know, you can be not judged even temporarily um, for some of those decisions and you're just, we get it. I understand how you got here. It doesn't mean it's right. Or it doesn't mean that, you know, whatever those choices were and the people you heard along the way or didn't hurt you, including yourself, that was that I'm saying, yes, good job. I'm saying, I get it. Mm-hmm. I get it. I get it. And then once we get it, then it's so much easier to say now what? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, you were, we were talking earlier and, and uh, 
you're saying there's, you know, there's a lot of us versus them on social media and stuff. And it's a lot harder face to face to dislike someone. And there are more similarities than differences. And, uh, I mean, for me, so one example for me was there was this fella, he was a, he was a native guy. He was in a native gang. He was fresh out of jail. And, um, not that I was ever racist or anything. And we became quick, fast friends. Um, like his, his story was just absolutely heartbreaking. And so, yeah, you do, you do learn and grow as a person by connecting with people that you, you wouldn't normally. And right. And I, and I think that's the point, right. Is that we all come with such deep racial biases. And I think, you know, I have to talk about this. I was raised in a very racist community. I have very racist beliefs hmm. and I, I struggle with those every single day because the, you, you can't address what you don't acknowledge. Right. And so of course, none of us want to be racist. None of us want to believe that we're bigots or that we, you know, we would be harmful in times of, you know, distress, but turns out we are. And, it's sort of a little bit about when you've lived your entire life in a position, you know, whatever that looks like surrounded by familial beliefs or conversations about, or what these people or those people are good for. Um, part of the job around growth is, is that, that experience of exposure. Huh? Interesting. Huh? Well, you're not an asshole just because you're a white guy. Huh? Now, <laughs> you, you, you know, like it is, mm -hmm. it is that exposure that sort of allows us then to lean in and open our minds and grow. And, you know, and some of us, you know, don't have the, you know, the, the luxury, I will call it of exposure, but it's like, how do we seek that? How do we, how do we grow? How do we learn the things we don't know? How do we read the things and, uh, you know, do a little bit more of that? Because I think it serves our children well, mostly because you can't tell your kids how to be kind or anti-racist. You have to show them. And yeah. we tell that, you know, I say that you can hear me say this. I wrote a best-selling book for, um, you know, parents and teachers called Kids These Days. And if you watch me with my own personal children, you wouldn't buy the book. Because it's so much better at telling people how to do it at, rather than showing them, you know? And and I think that's the, the, you know, be kind. I'm always yelling at my children, you know, and I'm like, hmm, okay. Uh, you know, how does that translate? You you have to you have to be in a position where you can you can show. And I and I love your story in terms of, you know, even with your babies, like this idea of, you know, your book that you wrote, you know, it, dads cry sometimes. And what is that like? And and when people don't see dad cry, when, when kids grow up in a generation where boys don't cry, um, that it means you're weak and, you know, that that is your bias. That is your belief. And we're still very marred in that belief for boys versus girls, men versus women. The highest rate of suicide in this country is middle-aged men, primarily because they don't have an emotional language. We've spent multiple generations not giving them anywhere to put experiences because you have to suck it up. You're good. You're fine. You're fucking good. Don't be a mm -hmm. pussy. Right? Yeah. yeah. And now we're so confused why our girls have such an ability to be dramatic and use their words. And, oh, my God, it's exhausting. It, that is what we want. Because you have to name it to tame it. And if nobody's given you that place to put it, it becomes very difficult to feel like there's a safe place where somebody will hold that and not judge you. Mm -hmm. So how do you expose yourself to people that maybe you wouldn't normally socialize with? Like you don't just walk into jail and go, hello, native person. I want some exposure yeah, or exactly. hello, gangster. Uh, you know? <laughs> well, and, and, I, and I, I think this is part of the point, right? Is that it's so easily accessible if you want it to be. And it's our job, particularly as I would say, white people, if we're going to talk about racism specifically to be able to, to seek, the resources that are always available, right? It's, 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 I cannot tell you how many times in this last, I don't know, five years. I mean, I got a PhD in this country and I never, not one time learned about the residential school system. Not one time. Wow. And I mean, I put orange shirts on my kids five years ago because everybody else did. I never once questioned, you know, when I worked for child and family services, why 72% um, of kids uh, in care or indigenous, despite the fact that they make up about 10% of the population. What the fuck is happening? I never asked that question. See, because in this very privileged position, I just, I just thought that, you know, I believed what I was taught. Indigenous people don't know how to work. They have addictions issues. That's racism. And when you don't question the system, why are people relegated to reservations in our provinces? Fuck. What? Why don't 
Some people today have drinking water. How, how come? When we don't ask those questions, it becomes really interesting. And so the, the plethora now in this, I'm so happy to be alive in the system because in this day, because there's so much accessibility to, you know, Jesse's book, as I was telling you, if you want insights, you know, 21 things I never knew about the Indian Act, um, the ability to um, understand, you know, what the transgendered flag is all about, um, you know, what does it mean to identify as, you know, use the pronouns, they, them, there's a curiosity that is necessary there. And when things don't fit for us. We don't know about the pronouns. What them pronouns mean? Why are the kids using this pronouns? Why your man can't be a man, you be a man. You... Yeah. When we get in those places, it doesn't mean we have to change our belief, but learning about it, curiosity about it, being asking questions, um, reading about seeking some information means you're in a healthy place, right? Mm-hmm. When we stay really rigid and stuck in our boundaries, uh, sorry, stuck in our beliefs. Yeah. Um, boundaries are good. Yeah. <laughs> Boundaries are the good stuff. When we get, well, you're right. But when we get stuck in those beliefs, I mean, it doesn't mean you will ever change yours, but being educated or curious enough to wonder if you're still right, if it still yeah. makes sense to believe that way, um, I think is just, just such a, I don't know. It's, it's, it's such an advantage. It's such a, a gift that we have in this season right now. Hmm. Good. Good. Yeah. Good answer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So really be a, be a bit of a critical thinker when, when you're taught something in absolutes, maybe. Be, yeah. uh, and um, that our, our parents were raised in a very, very different time. They're, the yeah. way that they parented our children doesn't mean, um, you know, we're playing by a set of rules that, that does, doesn't work in this world anymore. You know, we yeah. had the square footage of the house. They, it is Retrospective data would suggest that our great-grandparents looked at their children 72% more of the time than we look at our babies. Hmm. And so we have to do things differently. I mean, if you think about the square footage of the house that your grandfather was raised in and the square footage of the house in which we raise our babies, I mean, there was many opportunities. This, the size of the bed that our grandparents slept in versus <laughs> the size of the beds that we slept, you know. With it, six siblings. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> and so th- you can't continue to play by a set of rules that say, you know, you make a good choice, I reward you. You don't make a good choice, I punish you. It doesn't work anymore. We are in this place where it's be kind, don't tolerate bullshit in that order. I think I think too. Partly, it's it, you know, as a as a nation, I guess our hierarchy of needs have changed, right? So back then, they they didn't worry about mental health and making connections maybe as much because they were too busy trying to eat, find uh-huh. food, find warmth, mm-hmm. find comfort. Mm-hmm. So now that you know, I know there's still people that need that stuff that don't have it, but for the majority of our our you know our. Uh, yeah, but even just societal functioning, right? Like, Society, that's the word. <laughs> and, and I think what's also really cool about this, Todd, I've been thinking a lot about this lately, like Esther Perel's work on love and marriage. And, you know, she talks a lot about the fact that, like, in just two generations ago, the roles were very clear. You knew how you showed up as a woman. You knew how you showed up as a man. You knew how you showed up as a wife and a husband and a dad and a mom. There was no freedom, okay? Which there was such predictability in that, which meant there was so much regulation, right? I just know my role. This is it. Fuck it. This is what I do every day. Now in two generations, beautifully in so many ways that has changed. The freedom is massive. You know, you can be an independent woman and a CEO. You can, you know, choose not to have children. You don't have to get married. You can, you know, whatever the deal is. Right. But the, the, the lack of clarity has caused so many questions around belonging. And so many questions around, do I matter? And most of the self-help books that you sort of look at these days are really around belongingness, right? What's, where do I fit, right? So we're in this very, I'm, I'm fascinated by this every day, but this transitional time of who are we as humans? How do we show up in our systems? How do we maintain relationships with people when it's so easy just to find the next one? Um, How do we stay connected when things get difficult? Because there's so many opportunities to just say, fuck it, right? And and maybe that's the way, like I, you know, again, there's so many of those things that I think are so fascinating as we, you know, as our children navigate, um, you know, these next generations that I think we we have to think about a bit differently. Yeah. And the thing is like for hundreds of years, it was exactly the same. And it's like, uh, it's changing quickly. And yeah, yeah, that's where the confusion happens in the disconnect. And then when we get scared, we get back to, we go back to what we know. 
right? Yeah. So we go back to this old set of rules that was like, okay, take away all of their iPads, punish the shit out of bad guys, leave them in jail for years. Nobody talked to them. And suddenly they're going to just turn around and be fucking nice. No, no. Because we're playing by a set of rules where that doesn't exist anymore. There needs to be relationship on purpose. We need to be thinking about, you know, re-engaging, waving to your neighbor, um, sitting with your kid at bedtime, having a conversation, you know, going on road trips with your family, doing those things on purpose that, God, it's so much harder uh, these days because we're exhausted. I would much rather sink into Netflix and watch how to launder money in the Ozarks than fucking talk to my husband because I'm so busy. (laughs) Right. We went to hockey practice. I got to get the kids to gym. Aaron's not home tonight till six o'clock. What's going on for supper? I have three of these podcast meetings. I'm trying to figure out what's the next. And fuck, I got to make lunches. Jesus. You know, so at the end of the day, we're just like oh, versus when our people historically didn't have all of this inundation with social media and TV and all this kind of. I mean, I wanted to sit down at the end of the day and play crib with my husband because that was the only social interaction I got. Right. So it's how do we sort of recognize that that hasn't aged? We will never automate relationship. How do Mm. we build that in despite the fact that it is still really, really difficult and will always be really difficult to do? We can't look at making relationships easier. We got to look at working harder at them. Hmm. That's what AI is for. No, Todd, no. (laughs) Hello, AI. How was your day? And then, yeah, we're good. Exactly, right? (laughs) And I mean, I'm not that old. I'm 45. And it is bizarre seeing how much things have changed since I was a kid. And it's like, uh, and it's difficult for parents to to try and uh, figure it all out. And I mean, I'm riddled with parent guilt all the time because I don't know if I'm doing it right. (laughs) It's like I'm trying the best I can and and I don't know, things are changing so fast and nothing's the way it was when I was a kid. We had three channels on TV and no internet, you know? Um, So, yeah. Um, and it, I mean, and those were those were important times. Those were sacred times. Those were good times. They just aren't the times now. So mm-hmm. when we try to sort of get our kids to fit into those boxes, what I think sometimes is then we're just slammed against guilt because we're not. This isn't how it's supposed to be. This isn't what it's ah right. Yeah. And here's the number one thing that I think we forget sometimes. I'll tell you, this is a child psychologist, not as a mother. Our kids are supposed to be assholes. <laughs> because the only way they learn how to regulate emotion is the chaos is necessary to learn the calm. And I want them to practice that with me, with their dad in the safety of our home. And so when you look at your children and they are doing reasonably well out there, if you watch them, if you were to send them to your best friend's house, you know, would they be assholes? When you send them over to the neighbors or to school, are they absolute dicks to the hockey coach? Okay, then we then we might have a problem, okay? But if most of the time, if you look at your kids and they're great with everybody else, you're fucking crushing them. Hmm. Okay. Well, then I'm doing okay. Did it, see? <laughs> but that's the yeah. thing, right? They're supposed to come home and get dysregulated because you can't learn how to deal with failure or anger or disappointment or rejection or, you know, any of those things if you don't have anywhere to put it. And I would much rather you put it with me and we try to sort that out. Is it acceptable that you tell me to fuck off or that, you know, we get into arguments or that you come out here this morning like my daughter did and, you know, she was like, I'm not talking to you because she said her brother, she didn't like her brother as much as she likes her twin. And I was like, listen, not cool. And I want her to practice that here because I know that's going to happen when she gets into other friendships. And so how as a family do we have conversations about that, right? And here's the truth. You need to get this right 30% of the time. You could fuck this stuff up 70% of the time. That's what the data says. Hmm. And you still can create emotionally regulated children. And so I think we need to give ourselves as parents so much grace in this regard because so much of this is in the quiet moments where the best sort of lessons for our children come. So, you know, as we show up for our kids, the best of our abilities every single day, I got to tell you, it's, it's enough. Okay. Well, you made me feel better. (laughs) Good. You're pushing it, Dad. (laughs) What do I owe you? (laughs) (laughs) No, this is great. I love this conversation. Good, good. Yeah. I, I, I knew, I don't know. I, I didn't have an agenda and I just had a feeling that we would just go. (laughs) <laughs> yes. just go. Um, I was just talking to another person about 
uh, for the podcast, and I, I say I, I do isolate from people in my own community quite often, yeah. uh, but then I have these amazing conversations online in my basement all the time. So it's like I don't know if it's because I, I I'm full and I don't want to make small talk or or what it is, but. Uh, yeah. Um, and I think they need you too. And I think that's part of the shift, right? Is that like, we sometimes assume that we can't handle because we don't know what they're going to do to us. But my goodness, you know, if I told you, I mean, we know this to be true. I mean, one in four kids right now have a plan to end their lives. And if I said to you, I want you to go to the 7-Eleven today, just get a Slurpee and make eye contact with some kid and tell me like their hoodie. Could you do that for me today? Hmm. Um, because I think, you, you know, you won't change a life, you'll save it. And I think sometimes we forget our power, right, of just noticing our neighbors or noticing the kids or volunteering to coach ball, even though the kids are assholery-ish every single day. Like, <laughs> it, it is it is that commitment, I think, to be able, you know, being able to do this together that is so necessary now because the less we spend time with each other, the, the you know, the, the worse we all are. All right. I'll say hello to people. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> well, part of it is like, I went out the other day and it was like, people were like, they were like, you're alive. Like we haven't seen you in months. And part of it is because, yeah, well, part of it is, you know, uh, COVID and yeah. part of it is too. I'm just really busy and I'm getting older and I just don't go out as much, but, um, but it's nice that even people that it's nice that people approach me. <laughs> you yeah. know, and still want to talk to me, even though I might not be in the mood or whatever. It's like, and that's amazing, right? Sometimes, yeah. and sometimes we make that assumption all the time, right? And we're, I'm not always social. I'm not always ready to have a conversation, but I, what I'm always interested in, and I try to switch this all the time, right? Is that like, there's always something going on with somebody. And if I even have 30 seconds, I'm going to give it to you. It might mean that I'm going to cut this short. It might mean that I'm going to make up the story that I have to go pick up my kid or whatever the deal is. But like, <laughs> yeah. do not ever underestimate your power just to be able to give it away, even if a few seconds, if you can handle it. If you can't, you're the number one priority. Mm -hmm. But really pay attention to whether, you know, you're doing that because, um, you know, <laughs> what's it serving, right? Don't forget how important you are to the people in your community. And I think it's that little shift that I think allows us to get a little bit more, you know, comfortable with, you know, staying engaged with the people that we're sort of raising our babies with. Yeah. I'm just so well loved here. It's so annoying. <laughs> God, I hate that. <laughs> Such a big deal. <laughs> Damn these cursed good looks. <laughs> Hopefully we'll see you in Regina. You with your best friend, Laura Lawrence. Maybe you'll come out. Maybe it's, it's very female oriented that one. Yeah. Cause even the event is called together her. <laughs> okay. Touche. Oh, I think you do a great job. I think you would fit in anywhere, Todd. So yeah, now, now you're in love with me too. <laughs> too much, too much. Thank you so much, Dr. Jody Carrington. It truly was a wonderful conversation with you. Uh, you were just very down to earth and yeah, what you see is what you get. I like that. Uh, maybe we'll do another episode soon. Maybe when, we'll, maybe when you come out with another book, maybe we should try a coloring book. You're a child psychologist after all. You don't have to do that. Anyway, so I want to talk about a, a meme I made the other day and I posted on my social medias. One of those kind of inspirational kind of words of wisdom kind of memes. And, and I wrote, Men, if you are known for having a temper, if you need to drink to relax, if you prefer work over home, you may want to consider talking to a therapist. And it was very well received. Lots of people shared it and liked it and whatever and whatnot and hey, hey. Uh, but I knew it. I just knew someone was going to say something. And of course, somebody did. Uh, a, a lady put, uh, why just men? This applies to women as well. And, uh, you know, it's also men's health month. I think also men's mental health month. I don't know. It's all the same thing. Men's health month is June. Uh, and uh, you know, I know what she's saying, but someone else responded to her comment and I'd like to read it because it, it was, it was, it was pretty good. It was a little uh, spicy, but it was still good. And the person responding was was also female. Uh, and they put, Why is it that any time a man tries to talk about mental health, some woman has to make it about her? 
If we want better gender relations, we need to support men speaking about their feelings without being accused of not validating the female experience. Obviously, this post applies to women too, but Todd is clearly a man, so he was speaking to his own experience. Men are statistically far more likely to keep quiet in regards to mental health because they have been taught over and over that their feelings are not acceptable. These are the gender roles. Us feminists continue to want changed, but we won't get there without allowing men to work through their own pain the same system has instilled in them. It's comments like blanks that keep men silent, preferring to suffer rather than speaking about their pain. It's why men are more likely to follow through with suicide than women. If you weren't aware, June is Men's Health Month. This is likely in relation to that. Women need to allow men a safe space too. If you were to change the word man to woman in this post, you'd be accused of mansplaining. 90% of the guests are women, and it's not like he isn't aware of the female struggle. I recommend everyone ask their men in their lives how they were feeling every once in a while. Well, thank you for both comments. I mean, it's not 90%, but a lot of my guests are women. And a lot of the male guests are kind of on the, you know, the professionals or the, you know, they're not people sharing their experience with struggle so it, it is hard at times to get men on here but uh anyway thank you to both comments i do appreciate them both uh and of course of course i know women struggle i don't know what to say about that uh, uh the number one killer for middle-aged men is suicide and so i'm a middle-aged man and i i made that post um, what are you gonna do anywho um <laughs> so that's my little story about that please please listen next week Listen to both episodes, celebrating 100 episodes of Bunny Hugs and Mental Health. I couldn't be more proud. Um, yeah, I'll talk more about that next week. So uh, please tune in next week. Uh, and until then, please remember to make your beds and to take your meds. Bye. <laughs>